Um, what I will try and, and do today is to give you a, an idea of what the origin of my personal bias is. My personal bias, as Mauro just said, is that uh, the world is actually pervaded by uh, one of several uh, scientific misconceptions about stem cells, which in the specific field is particularly um, intense, so to speak, to the point of actually changing the description of the biological world and pro to the point of providing for one specific defined object of the natural world, which is what I refer to as the skeletal stem cell, uh, a completely uh, non-scientific description. Uh, let me start uh, with this, which is the simplest image, a histological image, of the smallest of the kind of bones we call the long bones. It is a mouse tail vertebra, and it's stained in a way as to reveal as red anything that is bone, as blue anything that is cartilage, and as white everything that is fat. Bone, cartilage, and fat are indeed, if you peruse a literature of about 27,000 papers, what the mesenchymal stem cells do and what you need to assess in your in vitro assays to qualify your cells as mesenchymal stem cells. Now, bone cartilage and fat, prior to a certain time in history, were considered distinct tissues. And nobody had had the idea that these three tissues, besides being strange bedfellows, if you wish, uh, residing one next to the other, could actually be functionally and developmentally connected. So this idea was put forward by essentially two people um, who need to be credited for this. One is Alexander Friedenstein, who indeed started this entire line of investigation, and the other is Maureen Owen, who was the first to actually give shape to the idea that the relationship between these tissues was actually a common root in a cell that could be a stem cell. And because this stem cell would be in the bone marrow, like the hematopoietic stem cell, this added a special flavor to the system because the bone marrow would be the only organ in the body in mammals, but not only in, bum, in mammals, in which you would find two different kinds of stem cells. So, as I said, if you look at the literature, these are the two descriptions of the stem cells for the skeletal tissues you find in the bone marrow. And I would like to point to you that these two descriptions are completely divergent. In the one on the left, you have cells that are called stem cells, but skeletal stem cells that reside in the bone marrow and only in the bone marrow. They can form skeletal tissues and only skeletal tissues. They can be transplanted locally and only locally. And they are transplanted only because they can generate long-lasting tissues in vivo, like a stem cell is supposed to do, and only for that reason. And on top of this, these cells are also assayed and defined biologically in the, in the standard way in which you define postnatal stem cells in all species of vertebrates. That is, implementing a series of single cell assays that are uh, performed essentially in vivo. In the other description, you have a kind of stem cell which is a stem cell for the skeletal tissues, but also for many other cell types, which include derivative of the same germ layer, such as, for example, skeletal muscle, or the myocardium, or the endothelial cells, uh, or else that are derived from other germ layers, including neurons or liver cells and whatnot. And these cells would be found in the bone marrow, but essentially in every other tissue would be called mesenchymal stem cells rather than skeletal. And importantly, in the last few years, these cells would no longer be seen as cells that 
one is interested in, interested in because they are stem cells, because they can generate tissues, because they can regenerate tissues, but because these cells have some sort of other property, which is related to the production of bioactive factors, which justifies the fact that you use these cells for diseases that are of the most diverse nature, ranging from autism to urinary incontinence, going all the way through neurodegenerative diseases, heart attacks, strokes, uh, immune diseases, nephritis, liver cirrhosis, and whatnot. And the reason is that if the, the idea is that these cells don't function like stem cells, they're actually cells that you inject in the bloodstream, and they magically go to every kind of injury in any tissue site and magically release the precise concoction of factor which you don't know which one it is but the tissue does so that whatever ailment you have it can be cured okay now the fact is scientifically speaking these cells which to accomplish these tasks need to be systemically injected cannot be systemically injected because while you can locally transplant them, if you systemically inject them, these cells die in bulk within minutes because they're incompatible with human blood and they trigger something which is known in medicine as the instant blood-mediated inflammatory reaction, which is a coordinated activation of complement and the coagulation cascades. So most of them are, are gone in, in minutes. And those that are not, embolized to the lungs, which is the physiological filter for any particulated blood-borne entity in your bloodstream. And from there, they are dismissed within 72 hours. Okay? So the cells don't engraft, don't go to the site of injury. They die in a matter of hours, and it's whatever magic therapeutic effect they exert must be done by cells on the way to die. That said, let me just give you a very uh, synthetic account of what these cells actually are and how do we know what they are. The story begins with a precise experimental layout, which is a system of heterotopic transplantation, which originates to address one specific question, which was critical in the post-war era between 1945 and the end of the 60s. And that was uh, everything that was related to radio protection measures and, and therefore to bone marrow transplant. The question was, can we transplant hematopoiesis to a non-hematopoietic site and organ? And to do this, people started transplanting either boneless fragments of bone marrow or total bone marrow cell suspension to heterotopic sites in mammals and to watch whether you could establish hematopoiesis there. And surprise, surprise, the outcome of this sort of experiment was unrelated apparently to the question and revealing the fact that if you do that exercise, you reveal something osteogenic in the bone marrow. Now this something could be a factor, could be a cell, could be a hematopoietic cell, or could be a non-hematopoietic cell. And that this long experimental history is what leads to the recognition that it is, first of all, not a hematopoietic cell that makes the bone because it's a cell that adheres to the plastic. And I want to remark one very important conceptual point here. This is what defines these cells as bone marrow stromal cells because it's the adherence of the plastic that allowed in a pre-cell sorting era to separate by adhesion the stromal cells from the hematopoietic cells. And then downstream of this, the identification of a subset of cells that are clonogenic, therefore capable of generating clonal population when played at the clonal densities, and the evidence that this fraction is the one endowed with the ability to generate the bone, and the, the evidence that a single of these uh, clones could actually generate multiple skeletal tissues, bone cartilage and fat, for example, that introduced the idea that 
because this experiment is done in essence at the single cell level, there is a multipotent progenitor cell for this tissue. Now, this led to the idea that there could be a stem cell for the skeleton, but not to the final proof, because to prove the concept, you would have to generate one complementary piece of information, and that is to prove that your multipotent cell is also capable of self-renewal. <coughs> and this, believe it or not, wasn't done until we did it with you know, a, a, an amount of experimental work which is highly demanding. Still, nonetheless, the postdocs that did the work still talk to me uh, after a few years because this led to a, a cell paper in those, year, in those days. But the idea was that if that cell is a stem cell, it has to be uh, provable that it does self-renew in vivo. And to do this, you have to identify a set of markers which allow you to follow the fate of your transplanted cells. Mind you, this is done with human cells, so it's not that easy to use genetic tricks and, and for lineage tracing. Uh, and then prove that from the tissue you generate, you can indeed secondarily re-derive stem cells in culture. So this is essentially uh, what we did. And at the end of this journey, this is what we now know. We know the name, ID, and address of the cell. We know that this cell is a cell that is found at the abluminal wall of a specific type of blood vessels in the bone marrow called the sinusoids. That this cell does express a range of specific markers in situ, not in culture and that using these markers you can actually, as they say, prospectively isolate these cells and put in culture cells that express that particular phenotype, and that if you use these cells to, to generate an in vivo transplantation system, you can actually show uh, multipotents and self-renewal at the single cell level. This, notwithstanding the prevailing view of the object uh, continues to be that this is some kind of mesenchymal stem cells with magic properties. I'm not going to discuss these magic properties much in detail today. I'm just going to uh, show to you what is there that we can positively identify as relevant about the biology of these cells. This is the way in which, for example, you uh, prove that you can actually re-derive clonogenic progenitors from your heterotopic transplantation system uh, in vivo and actually use it for further experiments. You can actually show, if you primarily purify these cells, that these cells have a unique phenotype which is a blend of two different signatures, one of immature osteogenic progenitors and one of perivascular cells, precursors of smooth muscle cells, what people refer to as pericytes. And you can actually show that these properties are dynamic, that you can uh, modulate their expression using factors that either promote cell growth or abate cell growth and that the response of these cells to this type of uh, in vitro testing is exactly the one you predict for cells that have the capacity to become perivascular cells. So for example, for these cells, the potent mitogen is FGF2 and the potent anti-mitogen is TGF-beta. And TGF-beta and FGF2 are supposed to to be two of the three key factors, the third being PDGF-PB, that either release cells from a, from a vascular wall or recruit cells to a vascular wall. And you can actually show that this is exactly what happens to your cells. You can show, for example, not only what the effects of FGF2 uh, and TGF-beta is with respect, for example, to the expression of the, the so, uh, defining or functional marker of the perivascular cells, but you can actually show that these cells reside exactly at sites in tissue and in your experimental tissues in which 
you have, for example, the activated uh, factors that regulate their biology. Now, from this, uh, two things actually became popular. One was our uh, idea that in a, in a fervent debate of what would be the hematopoietic stem cell niche cell, which was polarized between the idea that it would be the osteoblast or the endothelial cells, and this was a cartoon from a review of the time in which, as you see, the hematopoietic stem cell would be niched out by either osteoblasts or endothelial cells, whereas the bone marrow stromal cells stained gray as anything undefined in our, in our psychology is also located away from any anatomical <coughs> landmark to signify the fact that we don't know where they are, we don't know what they do, or they look like. Okay? And we showed that neither of these cells was, were actually providing a niche effect and that the niche effect was done by a missing element. And the missing element was a cell residing next to an endothelial cell, but not being an endothelial cell, and being an osteoprogenitor cell, but not a mature osteoblast. And this cell became, and is right <laughs> now, the most popular niche cell if you peruse the literature. There is actually now a more fervent debate whether my cell is better than yours as a niche cell. So that people who seek to identify the equivalent of these cells in the mouse, because the mouse is the prime model for hematopoietic physiology, claim that one marker is better than the other and that their cells is better than the next and that their particular Cree lock system that identify that cell is obviously the best of them all. Now, being things the way they may, uh, the, the point to make is that uh, this concept itself may in the end have to be uh, modified and perhaps uh, in an unaccounted for way. The second point that derives from, from the identification of these cells as perivascular cells is the idea that if perivascular cells are in fact the skeletal stem cell, which is what people refer to as the mesenchymal stem cells, then perivascular cells or pericytes are the mesenchymal stem cells. And because you have pericytes in every tissue, there you go, you have a universal mesenchymal stem cell in whatever tissue, from placenta to the retina, all the way through your body. Okay? And this is based on the definition of mesenchymal stem cells, which is, in essence, a simplified fax analysis of a cell culture. Now, one important point to make is that if you analyze surface epi epitopes in a culture of connective tissue cells, Number one, you analyze epitopes that are highly modulated in culture. And number two, no matter what tissue you look at, you will come up with exactly the same phenotypic profile. And that phenotypic profile coincides with what you find in the literature as the defining phenotype of mesenchymal stem cells. So the exercise we did was to repeat these experiments and actually look at cells expressing this phenotype coming from the most disparate sources such as, for example, the bone, the bone marrow, the muscle, fat tissue, and other sources. And in all cases, indeed, you look at the surface phenotyping culture and it is the same, but you go one notch below the cell surface and try and define the phenotype not as an array of surface antigen but based on the transcriptome, and you discover that not in all case, but in some notable specific case, you come up with super specific signatures. This is, for example, the case if you look at skeletal muscle. And this is also the case if you look at another unconventional source of so-called mesenchymal stem cells, uh, which is the cord blood. And the signatures report to you that you have muscle progenitor in muscle and you have highly proliferative cells in the cord blood. But then if you combine this assessment with a wide array of specific in vivo transplantation assay, the bottom line uh, message that you discover is that uh, 
the muscle progenitors only exist in muscle, the bone progenitors basically only exist in bone, and what, for example, you culture from adipose tissue, which has become the most common source for mesenchymal stem cells, doesn't produce either bone or muscle, and even so, adipose tissue-derived mesenchymal stem cells are being pushed around the world to be used in patients for treating diseases of bone and of the skeleton, including genetic diseases, in clinical trials, or simply on a commercial basis. Now, all of this, of course, is inaccurate. What is accurate and true is that these cells can do these sort of things. So they can generate, if you transplant them under defined conditions, things that you can actually look at, smell, measure, weigh, radiograph, histologically process and section to the effect of demonstrating that you have generated a complete replica, not only of one tissue or the other, but of the layout of the organization of a piece of mammalian bone, which as you see includes a cortex of bone, a cavity filled with marrow, and a system of vascular uh, structures, and a tissue which is nothing but hematopoietic uh, bone marrow. Now, if you do this, you can actually show that this tissue contains two kinds of stem cells, which you can physically uh, recognize in your system. But before you do that, you can't help noticing one thing, that the structure you generate is indeed organized. And I want to recall the fact that the assay you do with pluripotent cells is an assay of the same nature. You take your cells, transplant in the back of a skid mouse, and you generate a teratoma. And a teratoma is a mixture of derivatives of different germ layers, okay? So if these cells had a, a potency that was to be restricted to the skeletal tissues, and that's it, then what you would get in this system would be an admixture of bone cartilage and fat. And instead, I instead of an unorganized mixture, you get a completely organized structure. So these cells are the only cells I know that are called stem cells, which on top of a specific potency in terms of differentiation and regeneration of tissues also exhibit a specific organizing capacity. Now we became interested in this organizing capacity uh, even more than we are interested in the cursor. There we go. I'm sorry. And we learned a few things uh, along the way. The first thing we learned is that, for example, the easiest way of doing this is precisely not to use a population of purified stem cells, but to actually go through a stage in which you take your stem cells, you purify them by phenotype, you make a bead of cartilage, what is referred to as a pellet culture, then you take the bead and transplant in the back of a mouse. And if you do this, uh, the structure I just showed to you is exactly what you generate. And in this structure, you can show that you can actually generate stromal cells in the marrow cavity. And in this structure, you can actually show that you can re identify not only your mesenchymal stem cells, which you can secondarily explant, but also host-derived hematopoietic stem cells. And these hematopoietic stem cells uh, you uh, show belong to the entire hierarchy of progenitors you're able to identify. So you can identify phenotypic long-term, short-term, multiple progenitors, committed progenitors, and actually the entire range of mouse hematopoietic lineages indicating that the marrow you actually generate in the mouse 
is a completely functional, genuine bone marrow, which is indeed enriched in hematopoietic stem cells. Now, the fact that you have phenotypic long-term hematopoietic stem cells is one of those kind of experimental results which, depending on what your mindset is like, you can use to say one thing or exactly the opposite. If you're out to sell your paper, paper which is what everybody does in the world, you're going to say, I've provided you the evidence that you can generate a niche for the mouse hematopoietic stem cell with human skeletal or mesenchymal stem cells. You can actually make the argument that your structure does not include any mouse putative niche cell, so only the cells you have transplanted and generated are doing the trick. But if you actually make a simple calculation based on the fact that these structures have a physical identity and dimension, so you can actually measure them, you can make the point that in a volume of tissue you have generated, there are about 100-fold as many hematopoietic stem cells of the mouse as you can find in an equal volume of peripheral blood of the mouse. Why is this relevant? This is relevant because the only input you have in this system for hematopoietic stem cells of the mouse, which you have not transplanted or manipulated in any way, shape, or form, are those cells that exist as very rare entity, no more than any place between one and 400 cells in the total mouse blood, those cells are the only input that can generate this flourishing local hematopoiesis. And then, if you think about that, that means one simple thing. The concept of a hematopoietic stem cell niche, as, as you um, are certainly aware, is that the niche is that magic hematopoietic site in which a stem cell stays a stem cell or becomes a stem cell. See, if a stem cell gets out of the niche, it's no longer a stem cell, okay? So the other way in which you can use these data is to forget publishing your paper in, for a high number of bucks translated in impact factors and actually look at the thing critically because those data per se mean, mean that there is no niche for hematopoietic stem cells because the data are showing that cells outside of the niche in the mouse peripheral blood can replenish a heterotopic site of hematopoiesis de novo and actually accumulate locally to a 100 to 1 uh, numerical ratio. If that is not uh, evidence of the fact that something is happening in that structure, I don't know what better evidence can be uh, conceived of. Now, if not a niche, then what is it that these cells do? They establish a serial capacitor along the bloodstream. So they allow the generation of a stem cell trap from circulating hematopoietic stem cells. But a different aspect of this is how does this actually happen? You can, in this system, uh, monitor the development of the bone-bone marrow structure in a way uh, that is simple enough. You simply harvest your transplants at different time points and look at what they look like. So there you learn that they first look like cartilage, then they develop a shell of mineralized phase, and then they become progressively reabsorbed until <coughs> the first piece of marrow appears, and then the rest of the cartilage gets resorbed by specialized cells, and the marrow grows at that, at that expense. There is one physiological process, which is the one that is crucial to the growth of the skeleton, which is called endochondral bone formation. And you could argue that this is what you're reproducing in here. 
but in fact you're not because for example the expression of specific markers such as collagen type 10 or functions such as the apoptotic demise of the cartilage that goes to endochondral ossification are not reproduced in this system. So something else happens in this system and we're trying to figure out what this something else is. We think it's easy to uh, speculate what this something else is in terms of morphology. If this is the front between the growing bone marrow and the pre-existing cartilage, and the green is the expression of the stromal cell marker which you use to purify the stem cells to begin with, what you have done is that basically you have transplanted chondrocytes, so cells that don't express that marker and it actually make huge amounts of collagen type 2 and agrican to build a cartilage matrix. Then this stuff gets resorbed in vivo by cells like these which are called osteoclasts and what these cells do is to chop away the matrix and release cells from the pre-existing matrix space. So these cells seem to join the party of the growing bone marrow and become there the bone marrow stromal cells you localize in the newly formed bone marrow. Now of course this is simply descriptive evidence but descriptive evidence is not always trivial and part of it is the fact that if you look at the expression of the stromal marker which is usually not expressed in cartilage cells you have not expressing cartilage cells expressing stromal cells in the growing marker not expressing osteoclast and then an erratic chondrocyte which you know is a chondrocyte by phenotype location anatomy and profile which expresses uh, at low level the stromal marker so the idea we're playing with and we're trying to substantiate more is that these cells actually can revert back to the phenotype of a progenitor so that you don't not only generate cartilage from the stroma but you can actually generate stroma from the cartilage and if the stroma is the progenitor of the cartilage you're actually generating the father from the son the fact that the marrow grows at the expenses of cartilage is in a way counterintuitive if you measure the size of the structures you transplant and the size of the structures you generate from what you have transplanted those sizes are virtually identical in virtually all cases so that means that you have transplanted a bead of cartilage and that bead of cartilage has turned into bone and bone marrow but has not grown physically has generated an organ and the organ doesn't grow however the cells within the organ do grow they for example you can show express ki 67 they you can show can incorporate bromo and that happens in the cartilage and in the growing stroma and if you simply block the capacity of these cells to grow in vivo and you can do that in at least two different ways you can a induce them to mineralize therefore to terminally terminally differentiate before you do the transplant or you can simply irradiate the pellet before you transplant if you irradiate the pellet before you transplant this is what you get you no longer get bone and a marrow cavity with a hematopoiesis you get beads of cartilage we can perhaps fuse with one another and make bone at the periphery but not generate the marrow so you have a situation in which you actually have one tissue that grows which is cartilage one organ that doesn't grow which is the organoid and another tissue that does grow which is the bone marrow so you have cell proliferation in cis if you wish and tissue growth in trans and this is consistent with the idea that you can actually generate one cell type from the other 
which is again something you can model in culture in different ways. You can grow your cells, make the pellet, extract RNA from the pellet and from the cultures, and look at the profile of expression of cartilage versus stromal genes and show the canonical upregulation of the, the cartilage gene and downregulation of the stromal genes. And you can do the reverse. You can take your pellets and release cells by collagenase and make RNA preps or grow the cells and then make RNA preps and then look at the same gene expression profile and get the reverse pattern of expression. So you can actually show that cells that seem to express in bulk as a population genes of cartilage and not of stroma turn to cells that do exactly the reverse. And of course the argument could be, well, you need to do this at the single cell level because you can never be sure that you have not left some progenitor cells in your pellet, which are those responsible for the behavior you observe. And indeed, if you release the cells from a pellet and look for stromal markers, you do have consistently a small population of cells that express at low level one or more stromal markers. But you can, of course, get rid of those cells and select for those cells that only express cartilage markers and not stromal markers. And you can use this, those cells to do two things. First, to see if those cells, which are no longer progenitor cells, are capable of initiating clonal growth, which is a defining feature of the progenitor cells. And then you see that these cells are 20% or more clonogenic. Or you can start your culture with a purified population of stromal marker negative cells and leave them in culture for no more than seven days, therefore exclude kinetically the possibility that you have one cell that takes over the whole population because of a super advantage in proliferation and turn those cells into a stromal phenotype at very high frequency. So we think that this is one of the most intriguing features of this system, which we refer to as a system of stem cells, that multipotency is not necessarily hierarchical. It is a dispersed property across populations that we describe as either progenitors or progenies, so that you can actually turn a progenitor into cartilage, and then you can turn the cartilage into a progenitor. And the other point I would like to make is that this property may have relevance for the way we conceive this system, not only biologically, but also for their use in medicine. And if I have 10 more minutes, do I? Uh, I would like to uh, give you an example of what I mean by that. There is one disease that um, we have been struggling for for the last 20 years. It's a disease that 20 years ago um, I said to myself, I'm going to solve it right, and become rich and famous. And there will be a, a marble bust of myself in the Pincho in Rome. Uh, 20 years later, I know that this has not happened and, it, and it's probably not going to happen. Uh, but this disease is to us uh, the epitome of a different paradigm whereby you can look at the relationship between stem cell biology and medicine. This disease is a stem cell disease in a dual sense. First of all, it's a unique disease in which a somatic mutation arises precisely at the stage of embryonic development when you do have pluripotent cells and in the pluripotent cells. So the cells at any place between an eight-cell sta eight stage embryo and gastrulation are hit by a canonical methylation deamination sequence in a CPG denucleotide in one codon in a gene 
that encodes for a signaling protein, and that, and that gene makes an overactive signaling protein. And the cells downstream of the originally mutated cell generate the three germ layers and their derivatives because they're pluripotent cells. And as a result of this, you have the effects of the mutation, for example, in neuroectodermal derivatives, like, such as melanocytes, or in mesoderm derivatives, such as the femur, or in facial bone, which are again neuroectodermal, or in endodermal derivatives, such as, for example, the gut, some endocrine glands, and other tissues. So you have a disease of the organism, okay? But the disease is a disease of uh, stem cell in a second sense. The, the reason why the gene affects the bone is that the gene actually impacts on the skeletal stem cells uh, specifically. How do we know this? This is, by the way, uh, the gene. This is the type of mutation you have. And this is the consequence of the mutation, which results in the overstimulation of adenylyl cyclase because the mutated alpha subunit of GS alpha has lost the GTPase activity to 1 30th of the wild type. And therefore, the cells overproduce uh, and sometimes accumulate cyclic AMP. The reason why the disease is a disease of stem cell a second time is that you can actually reproduce the disease as a disease of the stem cell. In other words, years ago, we decided that we would do an experiment that I hope I'll be able to show you. So many years ago, we did this experiment. We reasoned that if you can generate a, a normal bone organoid with normal stem cells, you can actually theoretically generate a replica of any monogenic disease in the back of a skid mouse uh, by transplanting mutated progenitors. We did this with uh, stromal cells from these particular diseases. And this resulted in a paper, which is the only example in my entire career of a paper that was accepted with no change in an otherwise reputable journal. So that means one of two things. Either the paper is very good or the paper is very bad. And we were never going to find out. Uh, so in essence, this told us that the approach was sound. And we were very happy. We had identified that the bone disease was due to an osteogenic lineage disorder encrypted in the skeletal progenitors, reproducible in the mouse. So we were very enthused about the canonical idea that then you can regenerate the skeleton with stem cells as you do with blood or skin. But this wasn't the case. It was indeed the case that, for example, you could <coughs> use the skeletal stem cells to play around with the idea of doing gene therapy. Yes. <coughs> you can very effectively and specifically with lentivirally driven short terpene sequences that are specific to a point mutation in the dominant gain of function gene, which is indispensable per se and ubiquitously expressed in the organism, you can show, you can specifically silence the bad allele, okay? to the effect that if the beta allele makes too much cyclic AMP, you can make normal amounts of cyclic AMP. And I want to point to you that this being the case, if you could inject skeletal stem cells systemically, and if those cells were to go to the injury sites anywhere they are, in any tissue where they are, then it would follow from this directly that this disease would be cured, right? And I would be indeed rich and famous. The reason why I am not is that you can only reconstitute sy systemically tissues that can be reached by systemic infusion. 
and also that have a, a, a physiological turnover time which is short enough to be rebuilt in a reasonable time. Now the fact that you have a turnover of your entire skin once a month and a turnover of your entire skeleton once in 15 years tells you what the problem is ahead of us but ahead of all those who think to be able to regenerate for example skeletal muscle with muscular dystrophy it's not enough to have cells that can make bone or muscle you must have a way to match this property to the inherent physiology of the tissue with respect of regeneration ability but the part that really came up as of late that struck our attention is what we, we observed when we made mouse models of this disease to learn from the mouse model what we could not learn from the cell-based model. And what we learned from the mouse model is that yes, you can indeed reproduce beautiful histopathological replica of a crippling human skeletal disease with a high degree of fidelity. You can actually take these pictures, show them to your friend, orthopedic surgeon, who actually deals with the kids with this disease, and ask him, what is it? And he will never be able to tell you that that is a section of a mouse bone, because he still is on the way of clearly distinguishing a mouse from a rat, but not quite there yet. But he will immediately diagnose that this is fibrous dysplasia. Okay? So you can reproduce the disease if you put the disease gene under a constitutive promoter, making sure that you express it everywhere. Okay? You cannot if, for example, you target the disease gene to the bone forming cells only in their mature stage. I'll cut a long story short, and, and I'll be happy to get into the detail, uh, if you wish, in the discussion, and jump to the apodictic uh, conclusions that come from quite a long story. The conclusion is that this disease is not indeed a disease of bone cells. It is a disease of bone, but it is fundamentally a disease of the fat cells in the bone. What happens, uh, when I get to this point, I've al always used up my time. I never get to the point of showing the data, but that's all right. Uh, what happens is that the disease hits in the mouse only the sites in of the skeleton that have fat cells at the precise time when the fat cells appear. And mind you, fat cells and bone cells are the progeny of the common progenitors. The progression of the disease, likewise, is completely overlapping with the progression of adipogenesis across a mouse skeleton. So for example, the disease begins in the tail, which is the first site in which you generate fat in bone, and it moves up the spine progressively in a manner which is identical to the manner in which fat cells appear during growth. And that this happens as a result of a absolutely unique conversion of cells in the marrow cavity from a fat cell phenotype through an intermediate which has a specific fat cell phenotype to a cell type that does not exist in nature. And this cell type that does not exist in nature is in fact an osteoblast, that is the cell that makes the bent bone. And it makes the bent bone because it does express genes such as an inhibitor of mineralization which has prohibited in physiological osteoblasts, but are constitutively expressed in physiological fat cells. And this happens through a sequence of events which we think we have 
characterized to some extent. But the, the fundamental point I would like to make at a minimum is that this response in the bone cells, which you can construe as a response of the bone cells to the expression of the disease gene mediated by one specific molecular effector, which is, say, MGP, is it a direct effect of the transgene? This is not the case. And it's not the case because this is not what happens in the mouse, mice that express the disease gene targeted to osteoblasts. And if you take the cells from those mice, you can show that this response at the level of a single stage of differentiation is simply not there. So for the disease gene to generate bone cells that make the disease effector MGP, the disease gene must be expressed not in the bone cells, but in the fat cells. And the reason why that is, is because, you have to take my word for this, but we can get to the data if you have any interest, is that in the fat cells, the disease gene triggers a cascade of event, which is 50% predictable based on physiology, which is the induction of a brown, cell, brown fat cell phenotype, which remains completely unstable in bone and goes to making the bad bone cells. The point is that along this way, we think we have identified at least three potential molecular target of therapies that can be tested in the mouse first and in patient second. None of which is a cell therapy, none of which is a novel drug, all of which are known drugs existing on the market. We suspect that because of this, this will never be of any interest to anyone because it would only be of interest to the patients and to us, but not uh, to any commercial benefit. I'll stop here because I, I realize I've used up both my time and your patience, and, and I'll be happy to take questions if you have one. Annie.